um, and um, I've got a lot of pictures to show you, and which I want to get through fairly quick because I want to hear what you guys have to say. And um, my time in Tibet was like a little. I consider it um, a snapshot of the 80s of life in Tibet in the 80s. So, um, and I think that um, yeah, I'll get to the, uh, yeah. So, in perspective, you had the kind of communist p harsh period, then you have the modern Chinese capitalist period, and then this, there was a brief opening in the 80s when it was open to travelers, and I just happened to stumble in at that time, and um, so I dedicate the book to Hu Yaobang, who I'm, without his uh, opening policy, I never would have been able to stay, so... I don't know much about him, but I know that he complained about the harsh treatment of Tibet in the early 80s, resulting in it being open for a bit. And then there was a riot, which the first one of which I witnessed in 87, and then it shut down again. And then it just went from bad to worse. Anyway, um, uh, I've got this rather bizarre intro with nothing to do with Tibet. Just that when I was seven years old living in the Highlands, I got bitten by a snake and ne nearly died. And um, I think it kind of influenced my life a bit, but I'm not really sure how. It's just a kind of an, another story. And that's my um, background. Who, who am I? Scottish childhood. Um, that's my mother in the middle there, who, who became quite well known in Scotland because she set up Canongate Publishing. And unfortunately, she died last year. And that's my grandmother, and my big brother, and that's me, the grumpy one in the middle. Cause I was not happy by having my freedom deprived by being sent to school. I didn't understand what the hell I was doing in school. I really didn't. It took me 10 years to work it out. And then I, um, I worked in Tibet, worked in Bosnia, and spent 17 years in Romania, and just only just come back to Britain, actually. I'm a travel writer, and but as you can imagine, I don't really make any money from writing, so I'm a problem solver, or PR consultant, um, and um, yeah, you could help me make a living if you buy my book, which <laughs> just published a couple of years ago, and uh, I sold that the first print run, and it's just been reprinted, and I've just got hold of um, copies now, so this is the first time I've given a talk for a new edition, so thank you very much for organizing this. Um, yeah, this is my um, traveling technique. Um, and um, I call it the psychology of travel, actually, because um, I think to, to, to travel independently, you need to leave behind a lot of baggage mentally and be prepared to um, live with the locals, open your mind, open your ears. And if you can open your ears and clear your mind, you can learn languages really quick. Like I went through school thinking I was idiotic and definitely could not learn languages. I did French and German for years, never learned a damn word. But when I was on the road, I learned um, really fast German, Chinese, Tibetan, Romanian, uh, and Serbo-Croat. When, when I'm with those people, I can learn it really quick. As soon as you start teaching me grammar, I switch off. That's just how I do it. And then write, write about it. So um, my travel advice, aimed at students mainly, is trust your instincts. Yeah, have faith in local people, that's a really powerful one. Meditate. Cannabis is an interesting one. I, I write about why I had to give that up. The first part of the book, interestingly, is overcoming my own fears and complacency, um, which are the main problems with independent travel, and as in they stop you traveling. Fear and complacency. Fear, I can't do it alone. Complacency, that was me when I was 16. It took me two years to build up the courage. And then I started making money. And when I was making money, I was getting complacent. So I nearly, very nearly didn't go anywhere. Travel alone, very important. Get jobs to, and then listen to languages. And if you listen to languages, you can learn them. And we were talking earlier um, about source material. You said this is a good source material. But my real source material are my diaries, page a day diaries. And I, I advocate everybody does that. Yeah, what's the book about? Um, my fear of travel. 
initially. I was going to call the book Fear of Travel, because I think it's really important um, how I overcame that. There's a few stories at the beginning of the book um, about things that happened that helped me overcome my fear of travel. Which, and fear is a funny one, because it's not like fear as in, oh my God, I'm afraid. It's Fear is hidden, and it, it, it doesn't come out in a fearful way. It's just... You just don't do it, and then you have to really analyze and work out, um, it's really fear. And then a big part of the book is looking for a job. And as you can imagine, looking for a job in Tibet is, well, everybody kept saying it's not possible. You can't do it. Um, you can't get a job here. Forget it. And I'm um, uh, very stubborn. When I put my mind to something, I just do not give up. So I spent over six months looking for a job in Tibet until I eventually got one. Um, and um, learning Tibetan and Chinese, not very well. And I was, I was just saying to Tenzin earlier that um, I picked up the languages really quickly and could use them in restaurants and shops and chatting and around the place. Um, and then what I didn't realize was that when I got back and moved on to other stuff, I'd forget the languages really, really quickly. So. When you learn languages on the street, you forget them kind of on the street. <laughs> um, and I, I did some trekking, and I spent a month on a horse riding into the eastern Tibet. And a big part of the book is, um, is uh, not a big, there's a chapter on that. And that's where I met, does anybody know Charles Ramble? Yes. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I want to read out a book a bit, um, a, a, a bit, of the book about when I met him. So I first met him in Kathmandu um, in 86. And then I was in eastern Tibet and my horse died. And there's a quite dramatic scene where the local Tibetan road worker helped me get rid of the body. which We dumped it over a cliff, which was their way of getting rid of dead animals. Um, anyway, so I was... And my, my friend, this German lady, Bettina, who'd persuaded me to come on this crazy horse trip. She went off hitchhiking in the truck towards Hong Kong, and I took her horse back to Tibet, uh, back to Lhasa. And I went through a really difficult period of depression and sadness and regret about all this. And um, eventually reached a town, went over this big pass, and got to a town. And um, I was so focused on the waiter that I barely noticed a figure who was striding past in the opposite direction. Suddenly a voice boomed out in native English, Hello there! Isn't it Rupert under that hat? I froze. Rooted to the spot, I glanced up and looked at the big bearded figure who was standing in front of me. He looked a bit like Big Jack, but was better dressed and spoke in a well-educated English accent. Who the hell was he? I hadn't spoken English for days and felt tongue-tied as if I'd forgotten my own language. I, uh, mm, don't you remember me? Uh, Charles, Charles Ramble, remember? We met in Kathmandu. Ah, of course, at the Canadian's house. I remembered he was one of the most impressive people I'd met. He was the only genuine scholar I'd come across. Sorry, the only genuine Tibetan scholar I'd come across. He knew Tibetan fluently, could navigate his way through several of their dialects, wrote books, and was a serious anthropologist. I remember him as an Oxford-educated, slightly weedy intellectual, but the man standing in front of me was big, strong, and impressive. He had the physical presence of Indiana Jones, as well as the same hat. <laughs> Look, I've got to catch a bus to Bailly in half an hour. Why don't you join me there this evening for dinner? We can talk. I forgot all about the Chinese restaurant and walked with him towards the bus station. This is my first chance to have an interesting conversation with a fellow countryman in ages, and I was enthused by the prospect. I had so much to tell him. A flood of experiences and questions were bubbling to the surface, but where to begin? I decided to steer the conversation away from me, as it would be frustrating to start opening up and then be interrupted by his departure. What are you doing in these parts, I asked, looking at his lethal sheath knife, which must have been a foot long. I also noticed with a slight twinge of jealousy his pots, pans and high-quality trekking gear hanging from the side of his rucksack. I've been exploring the Bon Mountain. You know it. The one over there. 
He pointed at a distant peak and I shook my head in ignorance. Is that a sacred mountain? It looks pretty ordinary to me. That's the Bon religion's most sacred spot in Tibet. I've just spent three days walking around it, staying in those secret meditation caves. My legs are aching. Isn't Bon the religion that was in Tibet before Buddhism took over? I'm afraid I don't know anything about it. I'm very ignorant. Don't worry, you're in good company. Most Tibetans know nothing about Bon, let, let alone foreigners. Less than 2% of Tibetans practice it, and most of them live around here. Um, and then, before I go, I must say one thing. What's that? If an old lady gives you an egg, refuse it. Why is that? You see, some of the Bon practitioners like to poison people so they can take the dead person's spirit. What? It's part of the ancient animistic tradition. They usually do it through liquids or eggs. So don't accept any eggs or unusual looking liquids or foods. I'll keep that in mind. The poison can take up to six years to take effect. Just take care. You know my horse just got poisoned near here. I shouldn't imagine anyone would want to poison a horse, he said, laughing. Meet me in the bus station hotel at Bai. Ask for the new, new Su Drang. Bye. And I met him later, and then the, the next day um, I actually got arrested because I was in a kind of forbidden zone with a horse in a town, and I'd been kind of going through the countryside and avoided the police, and we were way, way out in the east. And um, but by being in town, we got busted and um, told to sell the horse and another big, which I managed to actually avoid doing. And um, um, but that's all in the book. Um, um, so, um, how do we do the time? Yeah, so, um, yeah, why Tibet? I don't know if you know, anybody know Tibet? Does, any ideas where that might be? It's a, it's, I mean, the, the, for those who don't know it, it's generally fairly flat, with big mountains at the side of these big, huge flat. This is just by Lhasa. Um, big flat valleys with huge mountains on either side. Uh, why Tibet? That's an interesting one because um, I was just saying earlier how I didn't go to Tibet from here. With, I didn't even know about Tibet. Um, I was actually heading for Shanghai. I wanted to um, get away from Britain, get away from my family, um, get away and, and just prove myself to myself because um, you saw my mother earlier, she was a very successful publisher. My dad had a little business doing trucking uh, antiques and pictures. So I could always get work with, through my family connections. I, I was, since I was a teenager, I was doing jobs in the summer. And I realized that I'm always getting jobs through them. Can I actually get a job on my own? I didn't really know if I could. So I thought, I've got to get as far away as possible and run out of money and then get a job. So I, my destination was Shanghai. I thought that sounds sufficiently far, far away and I'm bound to run out of money by the time I get there and if I have an English language qualification, TEFL, I'll get a job, easy. And so my first title of the book was um, Hitching to Tibet, uh, to Shanghai. But, um, and I like the irony of the fact that um, I never made it. I never got to Shanghai. <laughs> I did spend a month in China, um, so a chapter in here is visiting China by train, from, train and bus from Tibet, and, um, but I never made it to Shanghai, because I, got, I reached Lhasa, um, and said, I just felt this really powerful connection, and just said, this is it, I'm staying here. And um, the only reason I got there, actually, was because I went to a bar in Hungary, and um, met an American guy, and told him, oh, I'm going overland to, to China. And he said, oh, you know, and the original plan was to go to Hong Kong and get a visa in Hong Kong, which was the, usually the only place you could get into China in the old days. Um, that was the plan. And you've got to go through lots of little countries, Southeast Asia, it would have been difficult, expensive. And, um, and he said, oh, you know, they just opened up the border at Kathmandu. You can get in through Kathmandu. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I changed my plan and ended up going to India, into Kathmandu. I went to the, I was telling you the story. I went to the Chinese embassy and said, hi, can I get a visa? No, forget it. 
no chance, go away. Um, and I thought, hell, what am I going to do? And, um, and I met this um, Chinese-American girl at the hostel and said, oh, I've come all this way, I'm trying to get into Tibet, and they won't give me a visa, and they didn't say why, what to do. And she said, oh, I know what you do, you, you've got to apply in New York. I said, what? I'm not going to go to New York. No, no, you just send them a cable and say you want a visa for Tibet and pay them this fee. Really? Yeah. And they'll, so I, I sent a, a wire to, in those days, no email, of course, it was all just telegra telegrams and tele telex. Sent a message to New York Embassy, Chinese Embassy in New York, I want a visa to go overland into Tibet. Okay, pay 50 bucks to whatever account, and then they send a message to Kathmandu saying, okay. And then the Chinese embassy gave me a visa. And uh, I remember I hitchhiked in, and I got a lift on the back of a motorbike to the border, and then walked up the border. It was amazing, actually. There was a really rickety little bridge. And um, uh, I don't know if you know that border from Kathmandu. It's really wild and uh, steep, and rocks are falling down. All then they were, anyway. And, um, and then I started hitching and it just, the adventure began. And I still didn't really know anything about Tibet. And, um, um, but I got to Lhasa and just thought, something, I felt something. And I felt, this is where I want to be. And, and actually, I, the more I stayed there, the more I wanted to stay there. I, I wanted to basically live there forever. But I got kicked out a year later. When the 1st of October 1987, they had a, a riot. A, um, and burned down the police station, and the police were shooting, and um, I got kind of implicated and basically kicked out. Um, so that was the end of that. Um, oh yeah. Um, now the other thing, I said it's like a kind of snapshot of Tibet in those days, because there's lots of detail in there about clothing and eating and ways of living and things that were just ordinary, but. I think that's its value really, is that it's a kind of document of how people live. And one of the things I found really interesting was the, the architecture was earthquake proof. Uh, and if you look at that building, you'll see it's brilliantly designed for an earthquake, as in all the building leans in. So you can have a massive earthquake and it's going to be there afterwards, because they have big earthquakes there. There was a big earthquake, just, I was talking about that riot in um, October 1st, 1987. Well, about a week or two before that, there was an earthquake. And um, I remember vividly, actually, I remember vividly because I was lying in, in, in this bed in this little room that I was renting. Because the other thing I did was stay with locals and stay. I, I wanted to get away from the foreigners and stay with locals. And I ended up living in this school that was, this English school that was made in this place called Shatta. Shatter Palace, it's an old palace, like a block of flats now. And um, this earthquake came one morning, and I remember I was lying in bed, asleep, and there was this banging and thumping, and I, I thought somebody was at the door, banging on the door. And I woke up and thought, oh shit, it's an earthquake. What do I do? Do I jump out the window, and then, or not, because I didn't have any clothes on. And I thought, if I jump out the window, everyone's going to see me and laugh at me. Or do I stay in bed and risk getting crushed? I stayed in bed. <laughs> anyway, um, later that day, the Tibetans were going around saying, this is really bad omen, this earthquake is like really bad omen in Tibetan culture, apparently. It's, um, earthquake is a yeah, really bad omen. And somebody else said to me, oh, um, the statues in the Jokang Palace, the, the earthquake opens their eyes for some bad thing to happen. And then there was also a double rainbow that week, actually, the week before, and apparently that's another bad omen. Anyway, um, yeah, the Potala Palace is another earthquake. It's probably 500 years old, I think. And um, again, you can see that le inward leaning style. It survived God knows how many earthquakes. And apparently, um, when they built that, on a hill, you know, it's on a hill. They use some technique, some uh, construction technique using copper 
fixing the copper to the rock. I don't really know the details, but apparently it was built back then with earthquakes in mind. And it's obviously done a good job. Oh yeah, and then Lhasa. And um, um, I, I don't know if you recognize these people, Kam, Kampa people, from the eastern part of um, Tibet. Um, they come, there was always Kampa people in Lhasa, like all the time. And they'd wear this kind of long um, cloak, is it? I'm not sure. Chuba. Chuba, Chuba yeah. Yes. I don't know what you call that in English. Um, like a kind of long coat, isn't it? With a, yeah, long coat. With a big strap around the middle. And the men would always have a big sword down the side. And they were quite kind of loud. And um, kind of a bit like the Scots, actually. Um, quite loud and drinking a lot. And um, One of the best things I did was I ended up staying in a flat, well, no, a flat's the wrong word, a tiny little hovel is the better word, of, of this Kampa woman who was very small, she was, she had a, crip, a bad back, her back was like this, and she, she'd go around like this, in a little house, the house was about the size of here, just one little room, and there was a little bench, my bed, a little bench, her bed, and a fire, and the bench was like, always filled with these big Kampa guys, drinking and smoking and all these big guys would come in and hang out with her and kind of look after her, I guess. And, and then I'd sleep there. And then she had a tiny little yard about the size of, not much bigger than that table, which had a bed frame on it. And on the bed frame, I thought this was great because I was so happy to be staying with locals that I didn't realize how crappy it really was. And then my mother came to visit me and I showed her this place with pride and she said, you're not staying there. So she couldn't believe it because the, bed, the outside bed was, um, uh, it was just like, it just had a couple of planks and the, the, the bedding consisted of one of those old army coats with um, fur lining. And, um, but again, I, I didn't even notice the discomfort. I don't know what happened to the computer. Um, anyway, so... You probably know those stupa things where they would make offerings and burn, I think, juniper. Yes, that's juniper, yes. And you get this smell all the time of, nice smell of juniper. And, and the, the, the pilgrims had, they were really good fun. They were always having a laugh, actually. And, um, and what I really like about Tibetan Buddhism is that, is that people seem to enjoy it and have fun which was amazing because when the Western Buddhists came out they were all very serious and um, they'd been studying it for years and um, they took everything so seriously and they spoke in a very correct way and the monks would look at them like you know, here, here comes some teacher type and then they'd, I'd be joking with them and hanging out with them and kind of having fun <coughs> with them and um, <coughs> yeah I wanted to show you this picture too because um, um, you can see in the 80s, before the mass migration of the Chinese, um, the Chinese were actually, I got on with them really well too, they were generally really nice and um, friendly. And it's interesting to watch the clothes and the bicycles, you know, classic Chinese gear from the 80s. And people like, you know, little business fixing bikes on the left there. And this is really interesting here, you can see something about the buildings, the sort of stone work with this mortar between it and every window had a little thing on top to stop the rain and these little curtains and the windows were usually decorated it was all very nice um, interesting oh yeah and um, and there's another interesting one where you can see the bike as transport you know carrying a big thing of um, Chang do you know Chang? like an alcohol made from barley disgusting stuff but it does the job, gets you drunk, and um, um, this Tibetan guy wearing Chinese gear, and these Tibetan people wearing Tibetan gear, and old people were really important in my story, because when I was traveling, it was usually the old people who put me up, they'd give me accommodation and food, and um, fodder when I was traveling with a horse, because we didn't really have any food with us, we'd have to buy it off the locals, and they didn't have much, so it was quite hard to 
persuaded them to sell us anything. And um, so the old people were amazing. They, they kind of made my visit possible, really. The old people and the, and the kids. Oh yeah, and the pilgrims. This is the Jokan Palace. And um, the stones outside the front are polished to a very high polish because they prostrate themselves. Um, I don't know if they still do this, but they prostrate themselves 108 times or sometimes more. So there's people prostrating themselves constantly, rubbing the stones to a bright polish. And um, yeah, I ended up living very close to Jokang Palace, just around the corner actually. So, and doing the Borka, the walk. Is it the Borka? The, the walk around the center. Kora. Kora, yeah. Yeah, I, I used to know Tibetan, but it's all. It's, it's gone. And, um, I, uh, and, and um, when I was traveling in eastern Tibet, I, I came across pilgrims who were um, doing this massive journey hundreds of miles into the Jok towards the Jokang Palace, which I believe is the most holy place in Tibet. And they would, some of them would do this um, walk where they would um, stand and, and then put themselves on the floor and take one step, stand up, put themselves down again, up and just move like that. And they, they used to wear these um, gloves that were like leather here and a big wooden block, like a shoe. And then they just throw themselves on the ground on these things and um, stand up. And the guys I met, they had nothing. They, they literally had nothing on them, just a big smile. And they looked quite happy, which is surprising, doing this exercise all day long. And I never understood how, what they lived off. We would give them whatever food we had, which is hardly anything. But actually, you just, um, my friend Tommy just explained how it worked. I found out 30 years later that they had somewhere in the background some, somebody been pulling transport with food in it. So the pilgrims were totally amazing. And I don't know if it's still going on, because I haven't really kept up with Tibet um, since then. But everything I hear sounds pretty depressing. Oh yeah, another really interesting thing is that, see that flask in the corner there? Was that, that was a Chinese um, import idea. But one the Tibetans used was that people would, like office workers and workers generally, they'd go to work with a big two liter flask of boiling water and a handful of tea leaves. And they'd put the tea leaves in the cup and hot water, drink the tea, and just keep filling it up through the day until it was just hot water really they were drinking, which they call white tea. And um, I thought that was interesting. I don't know if that still goes on really. Oh yeah, and um, so when I was there in the mid-80s, they, they just started to rebuild the monasteries. And that was a big thing going on. Um, and it was really interesting to watch because they were doing it the traditional, you know, Tibetans doing it using um, Tibetan um, wood and materials and techniques. So it wasn't a big modern business thing, it was like a traditional thing. And actually, um, uh, I wrote in the book um, about this type of axe um, that they used, which is like an axe with a, a head that way. So they'd have a big tree trunk and they'd be chipping away at it to chip off. And I didn't know the name of that thing. I didn't even know it had a name. It was Charles Ramble who read the manuscript and came back with a ton of corrections, including the word of that. Does anybody know what it is? Ads. Ads. I had no idea. Has anybody else heard of that? A D Z E. I never heard of it. It's an axe with a kind of the axe that way. So um, yeah. Anyway, um, I had. When I was traveling across Europe, I managed to basically scam my way into getting a job in a restoration project in Vienna, in a pa restoring a palace, painting. Um, and it worked out really, really well, even though I was absolutely unqualified. And I thought that experience would get me a job here, but it didn't. I couldn't get a job doing this. I really wanted to, but I couldn't. And I wanted to show you this picture too, because um, I was saying that the monasteries were quite playful over there. 
and kids can run around and and that's a beautiful photo too. And then, I don't know if you know the city of Gyantse in the uh, western, sort of central part of um, Tibet. Um, and that's a photo of above, it was an old military place, a, a kind of fortress. And you can see the famous, um, is it Gompa? Is that? That could be a, a stupa. What's Gompa? Again, these words are coming back now that I... I Gompa is a monastery. Monastery, yeah, yeah, I was right. So these words are kind of somewhere in the back of my mind that are coming back, but it's all a bit... Also, you can see uh, in the foreground that the land is very arid, actually. Most of the land is very dry and arid. And it's, it's probably worse now because they've been cutting down so many trees. And um, you can just see the the natural way that the, the town developed, you know, in the lee of the hill, and, um, you know, that would have been very good in the wild winter weather. Oh yeah, and I wanted to show you this picture too, this, I think this is a Chinese guy, um, because this is how a lot of the cooking was done, was um, over a kind of naked flame of maybe oil-based or and they used to use these oil barrels a lot for fires, and it was all a bit s simple. Um, and, um, yeah, the Chinese food was always the kind of best thing to eat in my time there. Because they, they would um, use a lot of oil and a lot of spices, and it was always more, you know, more exotic and delicious than Tibetan food. I used to eat a lot of sampa. Do you know sampa? which is um, um, uh, barley flour and you basically get a bowl of butter tea with salted butter tea which when you say this to Westerners they go oh god yuck how disgusting but it's just like soup and when you're tired and in the middle of nowhere it's the best thing it's like an energy drink actually because mm -hmm. it's tea, butter, salt perfect and then you add the tampa in put it together, eat it, that's dinner and I had that loads of times Sometimes with some sugar, sometimes with dry, dried cheese. Dried cheese, dried to the point where it becomes like rock. And, um, but it's still food. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, fuel. Yeah, so the, the manure would get um, flattened and dried out and then burned in the fires. So, um, an ancient fuel that is very ecological, actually. Oh yeah, and Tibetans, they were, they were great fun to hang out with and be with. And you can see the, clo the mixture of Chinese jacket on the Tibetan uh, chubuk thing, which it always goes like that. And, um, oh yeah, and this, this was actually at the Norbulinka Summer Palace in Lhasa where people would come from all over the country with these petrol containers full of Chang alcohol and have these huge picnics, which were great. And um, I used to get given this stuff all the time. It was like a sour... I don't know how you compare it to anything over here. Um, maybe like a cloudy, sour wine, I suppose, is the closest thing you can compare it to. Um, oh yeah, when I published the book, um, I then um, I wanted to avoid the big Edinburgh Book Festival and I went to the Highlands of Scotland and launched it at a rock festival and then cycled round the Highlands with that bike and with a trailer full of books selling the books and did a bike tour because I thought that was more in the spirit of the whole thing and um, yeah so well we got a quarter of an hour left so I really wanted to put it to you guys. Um, you got any questions? Have you read Heinrich Herr's Seven Years in Tibet? Oh yeah. Very Is that much. kind of what inspired you to, to look into Tibet? Not at all, no. Um, again, when I went there, I was in a state of pure ignorance. And um, the only thing I'd read was Tintin in Tibet. <laughs> that was my um, <laughs> reference point. And, um, I started reading when I got there, and 
and it made for really, um, I, I, I call it, <coughs> and I write about this quite a lot, my, my exploring my ignorance, because it makes, it meant I went around with a sense of wonder, like I didn't know any of this stuff, and so I read that book and a few others when I got there, um, and it just made it all so much more poignant, and um, um, yeah, and obviously I, I sort of, his book did inspire my title, Nine Months in Tibet. And, and then um, there was, I got a funny email from Charles Ramble actually, saying this theme had been kind of done with other people. And there was one guy who got into Tibet and basically got kicked out immediately because he didn't have the right paperwork or something. And there was some joke going around that this was like 10 minutes in Tibet. <laughs> <laughs> But I didn't like the film. Do you know where the film was made, by the way? Argentina. Argentina. Really? Yeah. Um, were there many foreigners? In um, Lhasa? I mean, yeah, there. yeah, there were. Not that many, but there. Doing what? Good question. Um, actually, I, I talk about them quite a lot because when I first get there, um, I was. Um, you know, I had to check it out and find out what's going on. So I, I hung out with the foreigners for a, a bit. And, and it was really interesting because, like I was saying, what's your name? Chase. Chase. I was like in a state of pure ignorance. Everything was new and wonderful. And these guys were turning out with guidebooks. And they had these lists of saying, we've got to see all that, we've got to go there, and we get the bus here, it's going to cost that. And they were so organized, it was frightening. And, um, and they... They tried to pull me into the little expeditions and trips and stuff, but I just found the whole thing a bit too organised. And um, and then and then I realised that actually they end up with dissatisfaction because they'll have a list of ten points to see in Gyanse, say, and they'll they'll see eight of them. So they'll say, "Oh, we didn't see the last two. It's like really bad." And I and I go, no expectations. And I see this amazing monastery, and think, "What the hell is that?" And I go in and be, "Wow." And, I, and get a feeling I've discovered me personally. I'm the first one who's been here. Nobody else knows about it. That was the feeling you get when you're in ignorance. And then, and then you go and read about it later, and, and you 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 look at the writing in a, such a more focused way. But yeah, there were a lot of foreigners, and they're basically travelling <coughs> around. And there was quite a lot of people buying stuff up, like buying up antiques. There was some. Americans I knew who would go to the market and buy up a lot of silver being sold in the markets and all these precious, not precious stones, but these stones, these blue, what do you call them, turquoise and uh, semi-precious stones that people would wear on these beads and necklaces and stuff. And I remember this one guy in particular leaving with a rucksack, a huge rucksack, packed full of this stuff and daggers and bones, flutes and stuff which he would have paid like 50 bucks for the whole lot and sold it for thousands. And, um, and I remember actually um, being in a cafe, listening to these Americans talking and saying, Patala Palace, yeah. Um, you know, if the Americans were here, it would be a hotel by now. <laughs> so I write about them quite a lot in my book. and. Um, I try not to be too nasty about them. Because I was one myself, so I can't be. Yeah. Were there any NGOs there? NGOs? God no. Um, I didn't even know what an NGO was then. And um, the, the only, and I was saying earlier actually that there was only about 10 foreigners working there actually. Two, there was two ladies working at Tibet University mm -hmm. who'd come in through a thing called VSO. Mm -hmm. Voluntary services, over, which I suppose is an NGO, but no, there's definitely nothing like that. And um, um, you know, it sounds like the the way that you came to be in Tibet was maybe due to a slightly sort of anarchic spirit. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that word sprang to my mind. How did that spirit? Change or evolve as you travel to other places? Uh, 
That's very interesting, and I don't really know the answer. Um, except to explain that in, in the 70s, um, in the 76, 77, I became a punk. And that was my kind of anarchic moment, in that it gave me the kind of frame of thinking to reject everything. I'm going to rip up my clothes and put it back together with safety pins and go around as a rebel, basically. It didn't last very long, but it was a useful time for me. And I think it kind of introduced that anarchic side. Um, and I, I kind of believe in anarchy in a way, in the sort of George Orwell sense, which is that it's just a way of organizing local government without central control. And George Orwell actually was in Spain with the anarchists who were like a branch of the socialist front against the fascists. Um, how did it evolve? It didn't really. <laughs> and, and then, and then um, I've just read something really interesting called the I Ching, which you probably all heard of. I don't know if anyone's read it. Well, I haven't either, but I, I cheated in that I found it on YouTube, and there's an amazing two-hour reading of it by this American Zen Buddhist guy. And um, one of the things, um, there's a couple of points that are relevant here about my approach, which is, um, one, it says, when you hear people, different people react to the, to the Tao, uh, one of the ways is they hear it and immediately adopt it. And that's what I did, because I came across this book called The Tower of Pooh. Mm. You know, Pooh Bear? Mm. It's a really light mm. book. I saw when I was a kid. Mm. And I didn't really take it too seriously, but I kind of picked up some of that essence of basically just going with the flow and not imposing your ego on everything. And, I, and then I, when I listened to the Tao I Ching and some talks by Alan Watts, who puts it all into perspective, I started thinking, hang on a minute, this is kind of how I've been all, these, all this time. So I think I'm, I'm moving towards calling myself a Taoist, but I need to kind of work out more what that actually means, <laughs> because they'd be the last to say we're any kind of religion or anything. <coughs> yeah, so... And also, there's another thing actually, talking about George Orwell. Um, at the beginning of my book, there's a couple of um, quotes. Um, that I used, um, how did I write the book? Because I, I first wrote the book in 89 and couldn't get it published and thought I wasn't good enough and it sat there for 20 years and it was only after I got divorced that I found the time to rewrite it completely and then it got published and everybody liked it. But I read a couple of extracts which I put here in my book um, which um, gave me the confidence to write. And the first one was by Kurt Vonnegut from Slaughterhouse Five, do you know? Um, it, uh, who, who wrote, I'd hate to tell you what this lousy little book cost me in time and money and anxiety. When I got home from the Second World War 23 years ago, I thought it'd be easy for me to write about the destruction of Dresden, since all I'd have to do was report what I'd seen. And I thought too that it would be a masterpiece, or at least make me a lot of money since the subject was so big. Well, that's exactly what I thought when I first wrote the book. I thought it was such a great story, I'm going to make a million and be famous. And that really held me back for 20 years, because I thought, well, if I'm not going to be rich and famous, then what's the point? And when I read that, I thought, i just got to get this out, down, I've just got to get it out there, it doesn't matter if no one reads it. And, and then the second quote by George Orwell, who wrote an essay called Inside the Whale, um, also really helped me form my position. He said, so he was writing this in 1940, and he, he said, during the last 10 years, literature has involved itself more and more deeply in politics, with the result that there's now less room in it for the ordinary man than at any time during the last two centuries. One can see the change in the prevailing literary attitude by comparing the books written about the Spanish Civil War with those written about the War of 1914-18. The immediately striking thing about the Spanish War books, at any rate those written in English, is their shocking dullness and badness. But what's more significant is that almost all of them, right-wing or left-wing, are written from a political angle by cocksure partisans telling you what to think, whereas the, book about, the books about the Great War were written by common soldiers or junior officers 
who didn't even pretend to understand what the whole thing was about. And that really helped me inform my position in that I don't need to explain anything. Just say what I saw and felt and did. That's enough. Because the, the, the literary agent I spoke to said, look, you've got to put in lots of stuff about Tibet history and politics and explain the whole thing. And I, I said, no, I don't. That's not my job. I, I'm not going to write some kind of textbook. It's going to take a... It's like, that's why I talk about snapshot. It's a snapshot of 86, 87. Your mother didn't publish it. No. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, she said, "Don't go into publishing. It's a mugs game." And um, and um, and she said, "You know." When I told her I wanted to get into journalism, she said, "Oh, Rupert, I, you're going to be disappointed. They're so intelligent journalists. They're so well read." Because she was, was dealing with literary critics, and she knew I was a complete shambles at school. And she said, "You know." I, I really wouldn't want you to fail, um, you know. And of course, that motivated me so much to prove her wrong. And my, and my dad, who was a, a film critic in, in a newspaper, when I told him, he said, "Yeah, great, go for it. There are a bunch of bozos. You'll be much better than them." <laughs> so you have to kind of make your own way, don't you? Mm. Mm. Um, <coughs> this might be a hard question, but I'm interested in the monastery reconstruction period and sort of what you saw. Do you remember some of the details about sort of who was doing the reconstruction, if it was organized by the monastery themselves, if it was local artisans? Or yes and yes and yes. Yeah, okay. Any um, other details? Um, not, I, I don't know who was, um, well I remember, is it Gyanse? No, not Gyanse, the one just uh, going west from um, Lhasa, there's a huge, it used to be kind of a little city on the hillside, um, is it? Um, <laughs> yeah, but, but going west, um, going towards Cam, about 20 miles. A garden, a garden. Oh, go east, east, yeah, go east. 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 Ganden, Ganden, yeah. Yes. Where there was a whole city, a city, I don't know if it, I think there was like 10,000 monks there. And the whole place got destroyed in the 60s. And um, when I was there, um, they were rebuilding bits of it. Um, and obviously it was approved at a high level and money was probably made up. I don't know about that side of it, but I know locally it was all being organized by the um, monastery and by Tibetans. Because I, I, I then trekked from there over south, about three or four days south, there's another monastery, again I forgot the name, jeez, um, on the road. If you go south from there, it's a famous place. Um, did, did you say Gansi? Sorry, Gansi. You were at the, um, big, the big city. No, that city. was. Um, what was Gandan. it? Gandan. 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 South of there. Did you go across oh, the just, pass? Just to yeah. Go to Sanya? Huh? Did you go to yeah. Sanya? It's, a, it's quite a tough trek. Yeah. You go quite high and then yeah. you come down. It's in the Tsanga Valley. Yeah. And that's where I, I, I had a. I was really trying to get a job there. And I, I'd met the office. I went to the office of reconstruction of that monastery in Lhasa and had this ridiculous scene, which is in the book. Um, where I tried to get a job and got kicked out and um, and then I ended up at the monastery and met the foreman who tried to but they were all Tibetan. Are they were they monks or laymen? No, they were laymen, they were but they were locals, they were they were it was very integrated with the monks. It was very it was a very Tibetan operation at the kind of executing level. Mm -hmm. And um, oh yeah and I remember down at that place there was a lot of women involved. Um, it was very much manual. There was hardly any machines there. So I remember there was hundreds and hundreds of women with baskets on their back um, carrying bricks and mortar in these endless lines going around in circles um, carrying materials in. And, um, um, and then, oh yeah, that's right. And then at one point, somebody in one of the government departments said to me, oh, why don't you write a proposal to raise money for renovation. And I said, what? what the hell is that all about? I had no idea. Ironically, later on, I ended up setting up an NGO and working as a fundraiser and raising millions by just doing that, writing proposals. But back then, I had no idea about any of that. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, it seemed to be really well done at that stage because it was obviously authorised from a high political level. Money was obviously made available for that. And it was left to the Tibetans to organise. And I, when I did eventually get a job, I got a job through with this... There was a really little English school in this Shatta Palace run by this couple, English couple. and uh, um, But we were authorised by the... It was called the Tibetan... Consultative Conference, which was a consultative group of Tibetans who would advise the government on whatever. And this was their little project. I mean, in the, in the local histories of individual places, you very often read that they were rebuilt in the second half of the 1980s, and that there was, I think, often a, a lama behind those, or um, someone from the monastic group who would initiate it and then, then collect money. And a lot mm -hmm. of it was also done through donations, as far as I know. I mean, I've been shown documents, handwritten documents, where they write about the history of the monastery, and then people went around with that to collect money for it. So more work than the Rathman State. I don't, have, I don't have any any figures about mm -hmm. it. It's it's equally anecdotal. <laughs> yeah, and, and <laughs> just just the and thing actually, that I saw when I was there. That's very interesting <laughs> because no one ever. When I was there, nobody ever asked me for money or mm -hmm. mentioned any kind of fundraising thing. Yeah. No one ever. But you'd have thought that, I, I never saw any of that, I'm sure it mm. was going on, but I never saw anything like that. Mm. I didn't really think about it, I was, all I was thinking about was how do I get a job? Mm. <laughs> Certainly in the East there are more and more monasteries being built the whole time. Oh really? Mm. But um, the, the, you're quite right, it's normally the membership who raise the funds. So there's no money coming from government or? A certain amount if they choose to develop the area for, you know, like, like Shangri-La. Yeah. I mean, Lama is often that, yeah. connected with tourism, obviously, right. Chinese tourism, right. and so the, the government invests a lot of money into um, making the, the places fancy, basically, so that they would attract Chinese tourist groups. But in the 80s, there was also this kind of new program of, um, uh, like, nationalist the, so there were some state funding for different minorities in China, and Tibetans were considered part of the, in part of this. So there were some money, for example, in in um, publishing. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of money of the state that went into publishing in Tibetan language, and part of this were also for the the, the heritage. And so there certainly, I think, there would be some money coming from that kind of program also into rebuilding. The, the heritage sites that were destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. But again, in terms of you know budget, I, I don't know now in the top of my head the numbers, but there were part of this, there was some money that was going through these programs yeah. also into the rebuilding. It's, it's yeah. where they choose to. Yeah. yeah. And actually talking about books, I remember being at Ganden Monastery and leaving really early, and the monks were out there before dawn, about four or five in the morning, chanting and they had these books which were um, wrapped in cloth and they pull out this long wooden tube um, which was two long bits of wood um, about that wide and then in the middle a whole of strips of paper and they'd lay the book down in front of them like this or the, the, the block and then they'd, they'd open it like this and then chant from the script and then flip the page like that. Mm. There were just a series of loose pages that they mm. flip over like this. And it's just Tibetan books. Huh? <laughs> These are just Tibetan books. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> That's all. That's not Tibetan books. Is it? Mm. <laughs> yes, it is. And then they'd wrap it all up and yeah. put yeah. it... Yes. Yeah. That's how it works. <laughs> Still, no? <laughs> yeah, if you don't have any more questions, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting.